All right. Good evening, Worship and the Word Fellowship Church. I'm glad that you guys are here. And let me tell you, we are not going to have just regular old church today. We're going to have C-H-E-R-C-H. All right? And I'm going to show you what, that, what I mean by that. I'm so glad that you guys are here. So let's stand up. Let's worship together as we sing these songs of praise and worship to our Lord. Come on. Oh, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freed me forever, one day coming back, glorious day, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified. Free me forever. One day he's coming back. Glorious day. Oh, one day when heaven was filled with his praises. One day when sin was as black as could be. That's when Jesus came down to be born of a virgin. Dwelt among men. My example is he. Everybody say. Die. Sins far away, rising he justified, free me forever. One day he's coming back, glorious day. Then one day they led him up Calvary's mountain. That day when they nailed him to die on a tree. That suffering anguish, despised and rejected. There in our sins, my Redeemer is he. Everybody say, is he? Oh, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freed me forever, one day he's coming back, glorious day. Then one Sunday the grave could conceal him no longer, that day when the stone rolled away from the door, that's when Jesus arose, over death he had conquered. Now he's ascended, he's our Lord forevermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, free me forever. One day he's coming back, glory Sing it again. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my Sins far away, rising he justified, free me forever. One day he's coming back, glorious day. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sin far away. Rising he justified, free me forever. One day he's coming back, glorious day. And then they said, sit it all down. Sit it all down, you say. Lord, let your Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost come on down. Whoa, whoa, send it on down. Send it on down. Lord, let your Holy Ghost come on down. David, you do nothing. Do you send it on down? You say. Lord, let your Holy Ghost come on down. Whoa, we can't do nothing. Do you send it on down? Yeah. We need power, 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 power. We need your power. We need your power. We need your power. We need your power. The power to walk right. The power to talk right. The power to pray right. The power to live right. We need. We need. We need, we need that Holy Ghost power, that Holy Ghost power, that Holy Ghost power. We need your power, 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 the power, power, the power, power, the power, power. 
When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up, turned me around, how He placed my feet on solid ground. Come on, sing it out. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy
in the evening I'll sing you are good you are good to me You're consistent through the ages. Oh, what a friend of mine. So I'll remind my soul to bless you, standing firm upon your truth, knowing you cannot be shaken, because I've seen what you can do. Oh, you are good. In the morning I'll sing you are are good to be. Come on, sing it again. You are good, yeah. You are good. In the morning I'll sing. You are good. In the evening I'll sing. You are good. You are good to that says this keep on getting better keep on getting better yes keep on getting better you keep on getting better how many of you kids agree with that you keep on getting better you keep on getting better every single day you keep keep on getting better keep on getting better come on make that your confession you keep on getting better Keep on, every step you take, you keep, keep on getting better, keep on getting, even though some trouble comes, you will, keep on getting better, keep on getting better, no matter what the situation, keep on getting better, keep on getting better, oh, keep on getting better, keep on getting better, yeah. Because you are good. In both the morning and the evening, God. You are good. Father, I pray for the rest of the service, God. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit that's here right now will be felt not only in this room, but also of those that are watching online, God. I thank you, Lord, that your anointing is present, God. I thank you, God, that when you are in the room, things happen. Things change. Things fall off, God, and there's no way that we can be the same once we come in contact with your presence, God. So we thank you 
for abiding with us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Give the Lord another praise. Thank you, Jesus. Keeps on getting better. Keeps on getting better. Turn before you're seated and wave at everybody. Oh, my word. Just so quick to sit down anymore, these people. Praise the Lord. What a good God we serve. And uh, just a fantastic uh, time we had last week uh, in our prayer. And uh, the Holy Spirit just comes and meets with us. And, you know, we were just discussing how we had to be separated for so long. Um, we have someone here from the Brooklyn Tabernacle tonight. And we're so excited. After 15 months, they're finally going to get to open again. Praise the Lord. But we have enjoyed this wonderful fellowship. Nothing like it. Just, just the, the fact that we ever be able to come back together and enjoy fellowship with the Holy Spirit because we're two or three are gathered. He promised he would be in the midst. And his, his goodness. Now I know I can have my moment with him on my back patio, my new corner office, every morning with the word. But uh, it's just not the same as when we come together as a congregation, um, as, a, as an army. We, we, we are strengthened by the spirit that is in each one of us. And uh, we're praying uh, for others around the country that have suffered long enough with the separation and that um, the true church will come together again and uh, those that have not been faithful to the Lord would either get right or get left. Right? Isn't that how the old song went? But we're praying that we get right and that there's a great outpouring of the Spirit of God. And uh, we sense that every week. And uh, we certainly did it as we were praying for one another last week. I forgot that um, Wayne and Lynn were at a wedding this week. I was like, they're never late. Oh, they're not, they're not even in town. But it's a blessing um, that you all are here, and uh, for those that watch online, we appreciate you as well. Um, it's been a good week. The Lord is good. We just had, my wife and I just celebrated 27 years of marriage <laughs> yesterday. And, uh, you know, I've been putting up with her a long time. Wait, I, I think that's the other way around. But um, talk about keep on getting better. Keep on getting better, my, my wife. And uh, the Lord has seen us through good times and bad times, but we praise the Lord, and that's just the way it is. You know, that's just the way it is. That's the way it is for everybody. You think we got it all perfect because we're pastors? Uh-uh. We face the same situations and the same um, challenges, and uh, we're praying uh, for strength in our families and you know we're getting ready to celebrate um, Memorial Day our national holiday and I've already got things planned for the grill but we all know that it's more than that isn't it it's more than a day off it's an opportunity for us as our country to look back really um, for those who have given their lives for our freedom um, some did it willingly, some did it unwillingly, but they did it and uh, sacrificed their life. And, um, you know, we live in an age where up is down and down is up. And we honor and remember the wrong people for the wrong things. And I'm just going to tell you that I'm thankful for those that served our country, those that decided to put on a uniform and go to foreign countries and to be in harm's way every day so that we don't experience that kind of thing here on our streets. And I'm going to honor them. I'm going to look back and thank them. But I'm most importantly going to thank the Lord for his goodness because nobody willingly gave up their life for me except Jesus Christ. He Though we were yet sinners, when we were still sinners, when we still hated him, we still spit upon him, he still gave his life as a ransom for all of us. So along with remembering our soldiers that have gone, we're praising the Lord for what he's done. Far out, far outweighs anything anybody could do for us. So 
We're continuing to pray for our country. We're praying for peace in the world, in Jerusalem. We know that these last days, we're living in troubled times, and we were promised that. But the Lord also said, his love and his mercy endures forever. His goodness is there for us every day. It keeps on getting better. So I remember the old the, the saying that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Remember, I believe it's even a scripture, right? <laughs> but no matter what trials and tribulations come and are promised us in the word of God, the Lord said he would empower us to face any situation. And Lord, we look back at the year we've been through, some of us, not only this, the pandemic, on top of that personal crisis and trouble and trials, and the Lord has brought us here today. And praise the Lord, he sustains us. And um, I'm kind of excited to have a, a little reprieve. Thank you, Brother Stefan, for leading us tonight. Just a wonderful anointing. I appreciate the fact that you just welcome the Spirit of God to use you in music ministry, there's nothing like an anointed musician. You know, you can get up here and perform, but when you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, it's a big difference. And I'm thankful that you, you desire that and you hunger for that. And um, I think that's everything I have to say other than the fact that it's just my privilege and honor tonight that uh, my favorite person in the whole wide world is our guest speaker. Do we need to receive a special offering for you? A special love offering? And uh, I'm excited. Let's, uh, we're praying the Holy Spirit would give her um, his word tonight. And as he's already moving in this place, Lord, I pray that you're, you would speak through Renee tonight and come right into our spirits, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Do I say what you always say? Are you ready to preach? Yes, I just want to say that was great tonight, and those songs are going to go right along with my sermon. So, you know, God does that, doesn't he? Does it with David and I, Pastor David and I, every week, and we don't talk about it. Stefan and I didn't talk about it. He just sent me his list and went right along. And, and my title of my sermon tonight is, Be Thankful, Not Complainful. All right? So we're going to start in Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 through 8. Y'all are going to know this when I start reading it. But it says, To everything there is a season, a time for birth and another for death, a time to plant and another to reap, a time to kill and another to heal, a time to destroy and another to rebuild, a time to cry and another to laugh, a time to grieve and another to dance, a time to make love and another time to abstain, a time to embrace and another to part, a time to search and another to count your losses, a time to hold on and another to let go, a time to rip out and another to mend, a time to shut up and another to speak up, a time to love and another to hate, a time to wage war and another to make peace. The season that you are in right now, tonight, at the sound of my voice, what is it doing to you? What is it doing within you? Is it making you see the hand of God or are you focused on simply being comfortable? Is this season building a divine determination in you or a relentless spirit of not giving up? Or is it distracting you from God's purposes? We serve a living God. Amen. One who is with you through the good times and through the bad times, through sunny days and through darkest nights. And every season has a purpose. And God has a flow, he has a rhythm, he has a pattern, an order of things. And Pastor David has, has, has uh, talked about it in his sermons the last few weeks, that you look outside, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. The moon comes up, the moon goes down. Tides roll in, tides roll out, there's a flow, there's a rhythm. And yes, we can experience good seasons, and we can experience bad seasons. Seasons that we remember with a smile, we laugh about it, we have fond memories, and then there are seasons we'd rather pack up in a box, 
put a lid on it, and throw it up in the attic, never to be opened again. But every season has a purpose. Every season is necessary. The question is, how do you embrace a season when it's painful? How do you embrace a season of uncertainty, a season of challenges? How do you still believe that God is working behind the scenes when you are just struggling to make it through the storm? So the question should change from this. When will this all be over? To what is God trying to teach me? in this season. Have you ever heard the saying, the most spectacular view for a hiker comes after the hardest climb? Are there any hikers in here? No. <laughs> well, Marsh, I think Marsha and Dawn are, are watching tonight, and they have hiked. And I don't know if this is true, but maybe that's a true statement. But I would like to add that the most spectacular view of God and what he can do comes after the hardest season. The struggles of life are ways God develops our character. A little more patience, a little more humility, a little more prayer. Darren and I were listening to a song the other day. It's by Zach Williams. I love it. It's called A Little Less Like Me. You know, a little, like, a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith. A little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. And Darren called it. He says that they should just name this Fruits of the Spirit song. <laughs> you know? But your struggle does not have to become your identity, but rather be your training ground. Have faith in this season. Because you know what? This is just a season. It's just a season. There's no progress oftentimes, and we've heard Pastor David say it again, without resistance. It's just a season. I remember when we were told we probably would never have children. And we were in the 30 percentile of couples that there's no reason. All the lubing and tubing and inside stuff, it's all working just right. But there's no reason... You, there's 30% of couples in America trying to have children, and there's no reason why. And I would look at other friends, and they would say to me, well, all I got to do is look at a pregnancy stick, and I get pregnant, you know. <laughs> and I would be, that would just dig in me, you know. And I know they weren't saying it to be mean, but I, here we were. It was month after month after month, and year after year after year, and I was at the point where I was saying, you know, it's too hard. I don't want to do it anymore. It's too emotionally draining. And, but God knew. God knew what he was doing. He knew that we wanted a child. And he would fulfill that dream as we walked in obedience through a very difficult season. And God provided Darren for us in that season. You know, he was born. I heard him being born on the phone. I didn't have to give, I didn't have to go through a painful childbearing birth or anything. But I heard him being born over the phone. Four hours later, we got to hold him in our hands. I'm the one that gave him his first bath. And within 24 hours, we brought him home. I might not have given birth to him, but that's my baby. And I'm his mama. Amen. And God did that through a difficult season we were going through. So what did Ecclesiastes say? I started it off. For everything there is a season. Life comes in waves. It comes in seasons. I heard a minister use this analogy, and I loved it, so I'm stealing it. Okay, He said, the problem is we oftentimes see life in seconds. And when you see life in seconds, and yet you are designed by a God who sees them in seasons... You are prone to make some really dumb decisions because all you can see are the seconds. Listen, the reason I can enjoy my seconds is because I know they are connected to a bigger story and God is in control of that story and every season has a purpose. 
And you know what is so beautiful about understanding the season is I can start understanding that my seconds are connected to a bigger season and my God controls winter, he controls fall, he controls summer and spring. That's my God. He works in a rhythm. He works in a pattern. He works in sustainable seasons. And he never will give us more than we can bear. We might think so. You know, in that moment that I may be feeling overwhelmed in that second, I can say, hey, ha, this is just a season. I can't get tunnel vision and start living life by the second. Saying, God, I can't see past this second to make sense of the season. Who lives life by the second? Usually, those who are going through troubling times. You may think you're losing your mind. You may be fighting something in your body. You may be fighting something in your marriage. You may be fighting something financially. You may be fighting something emotionally. But I'm here to tell you that this is just a season. And I'm going to give you a little tidbit right here. If you're going through a tough time, if you're going through a tough season, if you're going through a troubling season, what does the Bible say in John 14? Let not your heart be troubled. And I'm sure many of you are like me, and you have a whole collection of seconds in your life where you were like, uh, God, what was going on with these seconds? What were you doing in these seconds? Well, you take those seconds and you put them back in their season and back into perspective, and all of a sudden you go, ding, 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 ding. I'm starting to look back at some of those seconds in those seasons to find that he was faithful. He was true. He never failed me. Being thankful, even in seasons that seem extreme. I mean, the pandemic seemed extreme, did it not? Sometimes extreme enough to test the very foundation of our faith. But God loves us. He wants us to be happy people, full of praise, full of worship. But if we are murmuring and complaining, there is no room in our spirit for us to even honor the Lord with an offering of praise and worship. And as people of God, we should not even be complainers and murmurers. Because this could lead to all sorts of unknown evil. You say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Renee, complaining isn't evil. Okay, complaining in and of itself seems harmless, does it not? It's a way to let off steam. It's, it's a way to just, it just seems not a big deal. I'm just complaining. But it is inherently evil. Not only that, but it seems to always have a snowball effect. All right? It always seems to branch out into other sins. Sins like lying, pride, envy, and even lust. These are just a few of the bad little fruits that form when you complain and stop being thankful. And one of the easiest traps for us to fall into is complacency. Listen, y'all, never be complacent. It's a dangerous thing to become accustomed to God's blessings and begin to take them for granted. It's a dangerous thing to fail to be thankful. I urge you every day, take some time out of that day to be thankful. Obvious things such as your health, the fact that you have a bed to sleep in, food in your stomach, electricity, shelter. These are basic things, but things we often take for granted. Just speak to someone out there who doesn't have shelter. See how they're living, and you'll realize how blessed you are. Speak to someone who doesn't know if they're going to eat today. Hear what they will tell you and you will realize how good God is. These are small things, things that we now expect to, to have, but life can happen to any of us, can it not? We never imagined in a million years that a year and a half ago, David would be without a job. 
treated heinously by other ministers, cut off immediately and left with nothing. But life happens. So we need to be thankful to God for so much, including the little things that we take for granted. You say, how can complaining lead to all these sins that you're talking about? Let's go to numbers. Y'all know I couldn't, I couldn't do this without talking about the children of Israel, the story of Moses. But let's take a closer look at how ungrateful and thankless they became after being delivered. After being delivered from the enemy's camp. And not long after being delivered, the people began to murmur and complain. I'm in Numbers 11. Not long after being delivered, the people began to murmur and complain. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Verse 2, then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. But their complaining and murmuring didn't stop there. Each day, God provided them with food from heaven called manna. And I looked up what manna really was, okay? And it was a, a small coriander seed-like in size, but white in color. And what they would do, the Israelites would pound it, and they'd make it into cakes. And then they would bake those cakes. Now, it tasted sort of like a pastry is what they said. Um, but raw manna, they could even eat raw manna. And it tasted like wafers with honey. All right, now, I want y'all to look at this, all right? God was so good to the children of Israel that they didn't even have to work for their food. It fell, fell from heaven every single day. All they had to do was get a basket and fill it up. But the Bible tells us they started lusting for meat. And complained because they didn't have any onions and leeks and garlic. The sin of complaining always goes hand in hand, comfortably usually, and almost anonymously with other sins. The people went from complaining about the manna to lusting after meat. And this story has always, every time I read it, I think of my parents. My daddy always told this story. Back when they started a church, it was their first church. They were 22 years old. They started a church, planted a church in downtown Atlanta. And they were young because I was still a baby. And my parents and the organist in his life, uh, wife lived in the Sunday school building across from the church, sort of like these two buildings here, all right? And they didn't have much food. Daddy said, you know, they were 22, 23, not much food. And he says, but they had mostly vegetables. They didn't have any meat. And he said, so they started praying. And he said, one day a knock came on the door, and it was a, a member of the church, Brother Springer. I will never forget. Brother Springer showed up, and he had a crate full of frozen chickens, 36 to be exact. And they didn't know, unbeknownst to them, Brother Springer worked for a chicken company. So he shows up, and Daddy said he was so glad that Brother Morris was not only good at a good musician, but he was good at cooking. He said they had fried chicken, boiled chicken, broiled chicken, baked chicken. They had chicken tetrazzini. They had chicken cacciatore. Chicken, 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 chicken. And he said, you know, he said after they had finished eating all that chicken, he never wanted to eat chicken again. <laughs> but he said they didn't want to complain. But he said, you know, next time we're going to pray and be more specific in our prayers. You know, we'd like some meat and some ham and shrimp. <laughs> you know. But back to the Israelites, all they had seen God do, they simply could not be satisfied. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 18 that God told Moses to tell the people to consecrate themselves because he heard them when they were wailing, saying, if only we had meat to eat. And you don't want no meat, I give you lamb. We were better off in Egypt. He said not only did he hear them, but he was going to give them some meat. And now I love this next verse because it sort of reminds me of a horror movie. <laughs> but 
Numbers 11, 19 and 20 says, you will eat it. And not just one day or two days or five, ten or twenty days, but for an entire month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have despised the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever come out of Egypt? Nothing was ever good enough for the children of Israel. They complained so much, the Bible says, that the Lord's anger blazed hotly. It became a cancer and spread amongst the camp. It even spread to Moses, one of the meekest men to ever walk the face of the earth. He got so upset that he said, God, just go ahead and kill me. Why did you make me have to deal with your chosen people? It's pretty doggone bad for him to say, kill me, just kill me now. And the story doesn't end there because the children of Israel complained and complained and complained. In fact, they would not stop complaining. They even angered God to the point that he started taking lives and sending plagues. Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So take the time to say, thank you, God for your goodness. Find a reason to say, Lord, you are good. You have been good. Your mercy endures forever, and it's new. It's fresh every morning. You know, things might not be easy for me right now, but I thank you, God, for giving me the strength to get through each day. And I, this, you know, I, I, I might not like how things are, but I thank you for still being right by my side. There are many reasons to thank God for his goodness. I'm of sound mind. I have ears that hear. I can see you. That's the goodness of God. Yes, you might have pain somewhere in your body, but you can still move and walk. I've been having major lower back issues, but I can still walk up and down steps, so I'm not going to complain. This is God's goodness. Good health is a gift from God. Some people have food, but their health doesn't allow them to eat it freely. Some people have money, but that money can't restore good health. We have to remember to remain thankful. And like the song says, no matter what it looks like, I'm going to praise him. Another reason complaining is so bad is that it costs you time. Did you know that the journey in the wilderness, and I didn't know this until I was reading up on it, was only supposed to be an 11-day journey. 11 days. But their attitudes and their unthankfulness prolonged their journey until it took them how many? 40 years. 40 long years. And even then, God loved them enough that their clothes and their sandals never wore out. Now, all my well-dressed people in here, (laughs) can you imagine shoes and clothes lasting for 40 years? I'm surprised they didn't complain about that. You know? I mean, as a woman, I'd be saying, God, I need some new shoes. I've had to wear these shoes for 40 years. They're not even in style anymore. Take a moment. Think about it. How many times as we, people of God, His children have done this very same thing. How many times have we complained about something we didn't like with our lives? How many times have we complained about the way we look, where we live, the car we drive? How many times have we complained about our jobs instead of just being thankful? Some of us have even been complaining while we're praying. Days, months, or years, and God's promises have not come to pass. Could it be that some of those blessings have been stifled and put on hold due to our murmuring and grumbling and complaining? And being unthankful is an old sin, one that started long ago with the most ungrateful one, Lucifer himself. Lucifer was kicked out of heaven because of his pride. He was God's most beautiful creation, 
a cherub that guarded the very throne of God. Ezekiel 28, 15 says, You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. And I believe that the self-generated pride worked hand in hand with the sin of complaining. Lucifer probably thought, Why must I have to worship God as beautiful as I am? Why does God have to be worshipped all the time? Why can't I be worshipped? I believe at some point he complained so much that the pride festered into lust for God's very throne. And not only did Lucifer's pride and complaining get him kicked out, but it got some other angels kicked out with him. It's so easy for a simple complaint to open the door to other sins and become a cancer to yourself and others because people are watching you. They may not read their Bible, but they're watching you if they know you're a Christian. And God does not like it when we are unappreciative. He showed that in numbers. It holds back your blessings, your destiny. Never let yourselves be blinded to the point where you can't see how good God is. Never allow yourself to be so burdened by the stress of this world and your situation or the season that you are in that you take your eyes off of God and forget all that he's done. No, it's not always easy. But we must remember to be prayerful in a state of praise and worship so that the enemy cannot trick us into being ungrateful like he was. Listen here. You actually have to stop being thankful to complain. You have to come out of the spirit of praise and worship just like Lucifer did To allow yourself to be consumed with enough negativity to even think about murmuring and complaining. You have to allow yourself to drink in that negative poison and allow it to swell up into your spirit to the point where it spews out of your mouth. Listen, your mouth and your spirit were made to continually flow with blessings and praise to our most powerful creator, not spewing complaints. And this is another reason complaining is so deadly. Anytime we are not being prayerful, thankful, or worshiping the Lord, we are left wide open for a full-on attack from the enemy. Because the devil knows this is how he fell. And he wants you to become a victim to it as well. What does Philippians 2.14 tell us? Y'all probably are going to know it as soon as that starts. Do all things without complaining and grumbling that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and warped generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. How long ago was this written? A long time ago. But it is true today. I mean, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and warped generation. Lucifer was called the morning star, the angel of light. And then they renamed him Satan, which is adversary. And he is so jealous because we now hold his position, which he can never get back. Because we were created to take over his old position and to be thankful beings that love God with all our hearts, our minds, our souls. And we are to shine as lights in the world. You cannot do that and be a complainer. And one of the ways to remain in a state of thankfulness is to take the advice given in Philippians 4, 8, where it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. Remember to be grateful and thankful people of God. The Lord has done so much, has he not? We need to give him praise instead of taking the time to find something to complain about. You say, Renee, how am I going to make this happen? 
I'm just a negative person. I didn't. I see the glass half empty. Listen, it's a choice you make. You and I have the privilege of getting up every morning and spending time with the Lord. None of us knows what tomorrow holds. So how do we want to start tomorrow? How do we want to be able to live peacefully, confidently, boldly, productively, fruitfully tomorrow? By starting off the day with the one who will give us guidance and direction, enabling us every single step of the way. And what does he want? You. He just wants you. You alone. No iPhone, no Samsung, no iPads, no computers, no this, no that. No to all the things that jam and crowd us. He just wants you. Don't you think God deserves your undistracted, I'll say it again, undistracted attention? And look at all the benefits that come with the solitude of just you and God. Number one, it'll make your busy days much more fruitful. Why? Well, as you begin your day with him and you're listening to him and God is guiding you and leading you because you opened up your heart and your mind to him, your day is going to be more productive. Number two, he repairs the damage. You just had one of those days, and we've all had them, have we not? It's just one of those days. You come home and you think, "Uh uh-uh, I can't handle any more of this. What happens? A time of solitude with him drains all that out. It's like a washcloth that you're just draining it out and squeezing it out. Like he's pulled the drain open and it all pours out. You become free and liberated when you spend time alone with him. He's not uptight. There's not anything about us he can't fix if we give him time. He refuels us emotionally. He will meet you anywhere you are willing to meet him. The third thing is that solitude equips us to face tough days. And like I just said, we all are going to have them. All of us are going to have trials. All of us are going to have heartaches, burdens, things that we have to deal with. But God equips us to face them confidently and assuredly without getting nervous, without getting upset, frantic, thinking, oh, my God, what is going to happen? When you get along with him, he stills your heart. He quiets your spirit. And he makes you an overcomer no matter what you're facing in life. There isn't anything else that could give me all of that but time alone with him. Do you want peace in the midst of your storm? Do you want quietness and joy when turmoil is all around you? This is the answer. Start when you get up. Look over your day. Say, Lord, I'm going to be here today and I'm going to be doing this today, doing that today. And I pray for your strength to be the person of God that I should be. And help me, God, to bring the influence of Jesus into the situation. Or you may be saying, I'm headed to the doctor, God. I don't know what the news is going to be, but I know you're sufficient. And I pray for strength. You pray proactively. Not after it happens. Pray before it happens. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Start the day off in peace. Breathe in God's goodness. Thank him for the blessings in your life. Like David just said, we love sitting on our patio in the morning. I just like to sit there with my cup of coffee, listening to the birds sing, breathing in, listening to a gentle breeze, you know, flowing. You hear the fluttering. I just love it. And Hebrews talks about entering into the rest of God. That means you have a problem, but you ain't going to lose sleep over it. You know God is in control. And this is one of the main ways we show God that we are trusting him, by staying in peace. Not up when your circumstances are up and down when they're down. You're stable. You're consistent. You are in the rest of God. Jesus put it this way. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough worries of its own. It's very freeing when you learn to turn things over to God. 
So where are you living? You're either living in the past, you're living in the future, or you're living in the present. The past only exists as a, a memory. The future exists only in the imagination. Only the present exists in true reality. So why do we ruin the only moment of existence we have by pulling trouble from non-existent places like the past and the future? Here's what happens when you borrow trouble from the future. Now you've got double trouble. If you live in the past and you live in the future, you're allowing two thieves to rob your life. But if you live in the present, the Bible says that God is sufficient for every day. Deuteronomy 33, 25, and I'm getting ready to close. As your days, so shall your strength be. That means, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. But I do know that for this day, I've got the strength you want me to have. As my days, so shall my strength be. Remember, he gave the Israelites enough manna to eat for every day. We've all got so much stuff going on in our lives that if we wanted to sit back and worry, we could all become professional worriers, could we not? But I choose not to do that because I don't know how God's going to deal with tomorrow, but I know he is sufficient for today, and I'm going to rest in that promise, and he's always kept his promises. He has never out-promised himself. We must remember the importance of being grateful. After all you've done, after all the places you've been, after all the phone calls you've made, after all the television shows you've watched, after, after all the YouTube videos you've watched and TikTok, let the last thing you do be to offer a prayer of thanks to the Lord as you lay your head down to rest for the evening. What season are you in right now? Be thankful, not complainful. I'm going to end by singing an old hymn of the church when I get to the chorus, I want y'all to join in and sing with me. But if you're watching tonight, I think everyone in here has, has received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you're watching tonight and have never accepted Jesus into your heart and soul, then I want you to pray this prayer after me. Can we all do it in the room? Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart and wash me clean. Live and abide in me. I make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day, I don't borrow from it's For the skies, they may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future. Cause I know what my Jesus said. Come on, sing it with me. Many things about tomorrow. I still see to Tomorrow.
for that tonight? I don't know about tomorrow. You see, it may bring, it may bring us poverty. But you know what? The very same one who feeds that little itty bitty sparrow, he's the very same one, hallelujah, who stands by you and me. Oh, and the path, the path that may be my portion. the flame or through the flood. You see, I don't have to worry because His presence is going to go right before me. And I'm so glad I am covered. Hallelujah. I'm covered with His blood. Come on, stand and sing. Oh, many, many feet. 